Hello again and um, welcome to the second part of this series. I've got no idea how long I'm going to roll this out for on Egyptian magic, on how I practice Egyptian magic, which I've been working on for most of my life, but it's been up and down and up and down. There's other stuff on my YouTube, especially the Staffordshire Pagan Conference talk, where I talk about a little bit more about some of the things that have gone on which have spurred this kind of session that I'm now doing. Um, I'm going to apologise for the last one. It showed a woeful lack of knowledge on Egyptian mythology. Um, I have been out of the loop for a while. Um, I then also did a uh, physical workshop on this for two hours and I actually got a load of notes this time so we're going to go from those this time. Um, so as usual and this is a oh we've got incoming um, okay I'll let the, oh okay this is something we know okay as usual this is a dual recording broadcast YouTube and down here on Second Life I have a group present sorting themselves out uh, you Second Life lot whoa hang on let me What's happened? Okay, have I got my copy? All right. Okay, no, just sudden tech issue there. You guys on Second Life, that's the YouTube channel where this will be posted to in the next couple of days. So, um, as usual, anyone get any comments, stick them on the YouTube stuff. If you guys here on Second Life, you need any comments, need to co ask me questions, this is the play, time and place to do so. So, you know, I've got a vague idea of what we're going for, and um, we're going to see how far we go, what points we reach. So, um, sh we shall get started. So, uh, well, let's. We're going to go. I'm going to forget all the mythology stuff this time. We're just going to get on to what I do. So, we have. Um, I'll do a slight recap because I think there's couple here that may or may not know sort of what it is I, I work with. So I've been working with um, the Egyptian scorpion goddess Salket. Painting of her is here as I'm just pointing above. A statue of her is actually over on the other side and I've been working with her since childhood um, alongside Anubis who's possibly yeah I think slightly in camera shot over my shoulder here next to Thoth um, beside him and I've got over there Bast and Isis and who else have I got? I think that's it really. Yeah, oh Hermes another version of Thoth and a variety of cat statues and oh, oh I've got Kepri there, the scarab sat there as well so I've got a variety of bits but I most work, I primarily work with my my goddess. Oh, and slightly out of camera shot up this way is the goddess Mart. Um, just a, a papyrus painting of her. So, um, my path within Comedicism has been up and down over the years. And there was a huge burst early on. Then I thought I exhausted all of that. Went into chaos magic and ceremonial stuff and general paganism and now I'm coming back to it and it's been a major learning curve. Things I thought I knew are completely different as evidenced by the last session where I quite evidently forgot most stuff. Um, this is the thing, Egyptology and the comedic practice if you base off the archaeological information is huge. We are talking a civilization that spanned thousands of years Things changed, um, the whole landscape, physically and with spiritually within um, Egypt were over that period of time. So, some of the things I have learnt within Comedicism is pick a time period and try to stick to it. It is really hard to try and encompass everything. Now, there are some fantastic um, groups out there and I talk to them now and again and 
um, a lot of Facebook stuff out there. The groups are great, and I have to say, they are good. Just got to be careful with facts because they're because of all this sort of chronology is all over the place and there's material that is confusing and conflicting getting good research material is a challenge so I would always suggest joining a archaeological society where you can get in some really good material which certainly helps there's, there's a lot of comedic books out there some by very good authors some by not so many good, not by particularly good authors. And they, and I wouldn't say they're not good authors. No, that would be bad. That would be really wrong of me. I would say they have not, um, I wouldn't even say if they've not researched properly. They're not altogether clear on where they stand. Are they pulling in um, pure Egyptology? archaeological research material or are they doing interpretation and merging it in with other influences nothing wrong with both sides you could go serious reconstructionism and try and reconstruct as much as you can and yeah you, you should um, again it takes a lot of effort and a lot of time <laughs> patience a lot of reading and a lot of doing but if that's the way you want to go then that's the way you go or if you're an eclectic in some way and you're pulling in um, comedicism in some form because you just want to work with that obviously I wouldn't say I would, it's a, we're gonna go down the Wicca line here of if you're not initiated in a covenant you're not Wiccan as opposed to you are solitary eclectic of some kind. In a way you could say the same thing with Comedicism as well. If you're not in full blast of Reconstructionism, are you a practicing Comedic or are you just an eclectic? Well, I don't give a damn to be honest. You, you do your path however you want. I try to be as much of a Reconstructionist, Comedic Reconstructionist as possible. There are problems with that, in that that civilization is thousands of years ago, things have changed, things are lost, we do things different, and we know things are different. And we have to reconcile those compromises between how much do we practice of Comedicism in the original form from what we understand and can physically, um, I've come to some other aspect of that, I'll get around that of um, practice so do what you want <laughs> just make sure you've got some good materials so in the UK I'm a member of the Egypt Exploration Society it's been around about 150 years I adore them I have been a member since the mid 90s um, seriously good research materials and as a member I get full access to the electronic version of the back catalogue fantastic I've got so much material I would drown under the amount of reading I still got to do <laughs> it's just constant and I've got a huge stack of books here that I'm going to reference in a second so we have reference materials now what kind of reference materials have we really got well a uh, couple of the main things actually there's probably three but I've only got two of them is possibly budges um, book of the translation of the Book of the Dead of Papyrus from of Annie, the priest Annie Papyrus. Um, that has been around a long time and it's been a good source of material. It's a bit archaic in some ways, not the actual content, but the um, translation using very quaint these and thous and stuff, uh, which I find really annoying. So um, you can, uh, that's a useful one. Then we have, say, the older Faulkner's translation of the Pyramid Texts. Um, I'm quite fond of because 
uh, for my particular time period that I like to work with, it's early dynastic period. That's when my goddess was reasonably more widespread known. She existed right the way up and she was very popular right to the end of the Egyptian um, civilization. But I'd say she was possibly more active around the early dynastic period. Um, obviously there's also some aspects of differences to how these things were practiced um, and the sort of core view of how they viewed it. There's also a slightly later version of the Book of the Dead, which is the coffin text. I don't have a translation of that, it's not, I think that's um, um, sort of in the middle period somewhere. Um, not my my kind of area. So um, so from so sort of the pyramid text in particular, it's from my understanding, and obviously I could be completely wrong. I always go by the opinion that I know nothing, and that I think is possibly a good thing because I frequently find I know nothing, even more. <laughs> so little I know every time I read something. Um, so from this period, um, per perspective, the um, pyramid texts are more um, astronomical based, whereas the Book of the Dead, um, it's certainly more rounded, more evolved, um, certainly a lot more of the theology of their um, belief system which possibly has changed quite a bit since those the pyramid text anyway anyway we'll forget that we'll move on we'll move on so we have some text there um lots of other texts we can base our research on uh one more oh here's a fantastic one another classic one the Le Le um Laden Papyrus, the Greco magical text, medical text. Um, it's, and I mentioned this at my uh, physical workshop last week or week before last. It's certainly obviously got a lot of influence, um, connection between the Greek and Christianity. You know, this was a fairly late period piece of text, and so there's a lot of different, not pure early comedic stuff there's a lot of mixture of their contemporary beliefs and uh, tastes so it's uh, interesting and um, some of it you got to take definitely with a pinch of salt and uh, weed out the good stuff but th there are lots of other useful things um, Another one that's really vital for me is the Metternich Steeler. Um, that's in the Metropolitan Museum in the US. I've only got one full decent um, research paper on it, which is highly detailed because it, it mentions my goddess a number of times, my scorpion goddess in that text. So I was after researching um, the correct spellings for a number of her minions. There's seven scorpions that are mentioned in that text and um, they're associated with, with my goddess and with Isis as well and I needed to confirm that the pronunciation, well okay we'll come to pronunciation in a moment, um, the transliteration of the hieroglyphs correspond with the text that I've been using. Slight differences and we'll talk about that now, really. Um, early on, I looked at learning hieroglyphics. It seemed a perfectly good idea to do so because, well, a lot of the decent material is untranslated at the, still, and there's always frequent arguments over the translations of various texts and so I thought it would be good to get first-hand attempt at trying to understand some of this text. Um, now this was, let's think, maybe late 
eight, uh, mid 80s, something like that. I was in my teens. Didn't have any decent research. I had some research material, but no decent guidance. And it, I failed <laughs> really badly. It seriously sucked. I could not get my head around it. I got some key phrases. Um, I had some material that I could work out the transliterations from and direct translation, you know, um, triangle, given, life, and I knew what certain combinations of hieroglyphs grouped together, what they were telling me. But it really was next to useless. I really didn't grasp the nuances. So I thought, okay, should I persevere with this? It would be lovely to, but I'm without decent guidance, I'm getting nowhere with it. So I abandoned that. And I also asked my goddess, well, you know, you're communicating through to me in my native language. I would like to grasp yours. And she said, well, why? Because this is working. Why go all that? Because, in effect, the ancient Egyptian language has not had a native speaker for one and a half thousand years, maybe. And um, some of the language still is partly surviving through the Coptic, e Egyptian Coptic church, where they use some of the language still. But obviously, things change. You know, even within ancient Egypt itself, the language changed, the writing changed, everything changed. Over such a huge length of time, things change. So, again, like the time span and t picking your time um, window that you want to work with, the language is going to be different. So, really, is it important? It can be. It certainly helps in some ways. For example, the uh, Metanix Stila thing. Um, no, the paper's over there. I can't reach it from here. I did. F I did work out a few things, and I have a couple of books. One sec. Um, yes, I think this one was one of my first. It was um, how to read um, Egyptian hieroglyphs. Step by step, I think it's a uh, British Museum. Yes, yeah, a British Museum one. And um, when the EES, the Egypt Exploration Society, were put an uh, event up for learning hieroglyphs for beginners level, which I would have loved to have gone to, but it's in London and that's a good 70 odd miles from me, good hour and a half by train getting across London and so on and certainly not by rush hour I couldn't do it and like for weeks this is I, I would love to do it but I can't commit that length of time um, what with everything else that I'm doing um, this was the main book they, they said you need to have a copy of and I managed to get a copy of this it is really good and it's helped it helped me get through the Metanix Steeler at least of the bits that I need. Not all of it, because the Metanix Steel has a lot of text on it, and I was only after certain bits, and it has helped a lot. And picking up some decent material, and again, this is going back to the finding um, authors that uh, pitch to where you want to place yourself. So, as far as um, research material goes, Obviously, joining an archaeological society, you will get pointers to new books that they come out, and they'll talk about and they'll reference. And obviously, reference materials on any archaeological reports will give bibliographies about other materials, and so it goes on. So, I find picking up um, good authors that have got a good reputation as level-headed, and they're not pulling in strange things like this is the this is one example and it cracked us up at the workshop a couple of weeks ago was there's an early period of Egyptian history the Barbadian Barbarian Barbadian time I'm gonna get roasted for pronunciation I think today um, well the art 
that I've seen in the British Museum is beautiful. But it's sort of um, now taking a modern approach to it, it looks very alien. <laughs> oh, this is so bad. Um, it's got long, thin faces, lovely eyes. It's and and someone will say, oh, you know, all this ancient alien stuff, and you know, the periods were built by aliens, and all of this stuff, and nah, nah, I. I don't believe any of that, and um, who's to say, you know, these things have been out of the ground for a long time, so, you know, perhaps this imagery influenced the 1950s sort of view on aliens, and it's such an amazingly beautiful piece of art that, you know, the influence on UFOology and so on could have, it's certainly a spurred that on um, but you know once you start getting sort of books sort of saying oh the appearance were built by aliens and so on then fine if you want to go down that route and that's what you believe go with it but um, I tend to try and pick with verifiable <laughs> when I say verifiable I've been to a few of these conferences and sometimes people get a bit hurt bit heated about well don't quite believe what you're saying there uh, it, it's it's it is good anyway um where else are we gonna go so yeah there, there's a number of um um authors um oh i think I, I probably mentioned this one last time about the the literature i'm not gonna go into it but ancient literature literature of ancient egypt by simpson Actually, I'm pretty certain I did mention it. William Kelly Simpson, superb book. Um, I'm quite fond of some recent stuff from Avalonia Press. Uh, obviously, David Rankin's Hecker. That is um, a superb book. Um, but they've also come out with some others from a lady called Leslie Jackson. One on Hathor and one on Thoth. And um, they are really quite interesting. So certainly look out for those. As well as, where's some of my, my other two favourites? Um, oh, here they go. Here we go. Um, my Heart, My Mother and Hathor Rising um, by Alison Roberts. Um, very good books on, well, I have a thing for Hathor. It's been a recent thing for Hathor, uh, probably about three years now, maybe. She crept into my life and um, she won't let go. <laughs> it's, um, in fact, it was a, a feast of Hathor yesterday. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about, oh, there's loads of other good stuff down here. If you want my book list, just let me know. I've got most of my library is on Egyptian magic. The other half is on mostly chaos magic and a little bit of general paganism. But, um, what was I just about to say? Oh, Hathor. Oh, festivals. Yes. Um, this is another aspect of Comedicism that um, has been a bit overwhelming in that we have a lot of festivals. If you look at some of the uh, calendars, uh, ancient Egyptian calendars, um, there aren't that many that survive, but some of the more well-known ones, the Dendera calendar, which is a quite fairly late period one, and um, it sort of gives the idea that they were having parties pretty much all the time. But then you've got to have to think about this, is that it's a big country, the various um, areas, administration areas, the gnomes, um, not the gnomes, but the gnomes, the gnomes, is it gnomes, gnomes, whatever, um, they had um, their own sort of local deities that they were interested in. There was also obviously the state religion, uh, state sort of religious practice, and then the personal religious practice. 
So state level, you know, you have major temples. They were doing their thing every day, no doubt. So they filled in their calendar. Then all these other ca temples filled in their calendars. And there was all the other stuff that was going on throughout all the time. So obviously, if you take everything that's there and put it on the calendar, you're going to have a lot of dates to work with. Now, if you've got time to party for three or four festivals a day for the whole year, then what are you doing? <laughs> um, you'll either be completely shattered or the one heck of a hangover uh, or just got so much time on your hands you could be doing something more useful but what I decided to do was pick something that was useful to me so for my goddess long story but I never thought she had um, festival dates but she has one due to um, um, calendar shift in the UK in the 1700s there's a 13 day sort of change we had the Gregorian calendar to put us in line with Europe and um, some calendars work on the original date some work on this adjusted date so either way it's it's confusing so um, there's also this fact that some people work from the new year being now shifted to August as opposed to very early on it being midsummer um the summer solstice date it's i work with both because i like two new years <laughs> so my new year i work with is midsummer uh, for the summer solstice then i also do one um beginning of august where quite a lot of um comedics now practice is the new year the ron wet rompet the new year festival so i sort of work with both because you know <laughs> you're gonna have one day you may as well have lots of days and if you've got lots of days you may as well fill it in with as many things as you can it's all partying it's all um relevant to the deities anyway so who cares they like to party anyway um so yeah, for my goddess, it sort of falls 6th of November is one day, or about the 23rd of October is the other day. So I work with both days. I make the November one is my preference because it's closer to Samhain, and Samhain is when I've always felt closer to my goddess, which just by lucky chance happens to be when her festival happens to be. And I was working with this years before I knew these festival dates. So listen to your instinct. If you think a festival date is good, go for it. Because you never know, a deity may be whispering in your ear that that's a good idea. So anyway, um, so 6th of, oh, 6th of November, 23rd of October, is my two primary goddess, dates for my goddess. So then, you know, that's like two days out of the whole year. I've got to do other stuff. Um, okay, I'll work with some local groups. But, you know, they're general will of the year kind of people, um, not filling in with my comedic practice. So, to fill in the rest of the time, I picked some dates out of a variety of calendars that worked for me. So, some are, um, so I picked Hathor because, you know, I've got a, a bit of a thing with Hathor recently. And um, she's lucky one because she has loads of festivals it, it gets absolutely um it's um yeah just loads <laughs> there's there's the odd month too where not a lot's going on but the rest of the time it's like every other week she's got something going on so you know that helps um, there's ones for Thoth and some for Anubis that I've been working with and I'm close to. There's also one that I picked up in um, a recent report from the EES called the Ten Dead Deities of Dendera. I've got a bit of a, um, not a thing, but I've had connections with sort of a chaos kind of approach to the craft for a long time. In, um, inspired by my goddess to explore 
some aspects of ritual practice. Must talk about the ritual practice stuff. Um, so I have worked at this one. I did it last year for the first time. Um, but it's like a 10 day thing leading up to midwinter solstice. It's um, confusing. And this is one of the big things I've also found with Cometicism and their festivals. Half the time, well actually most of the time, we've got no idea what the festival was trying to achieve. You know, obviously for the big festivals, you know, the state ones where Pharaoh was out, they're reasonably well documented about what went on. But when I have a festival date like yesterday was Feast of Hathor, who knows? Okay, the word feast possibly suggests food and drink was involved. Um, some of these, well, generally it looked like always food and drink was involved. Offerings of some kind. Um, there's one that I looked at, I think it's coming up in November time. It's the contemplation of the fertility of Min. Well, Min is the the god with the enormous um, <laughs> knob and um, that I think I found some documentation on and that was much like the maypole fertility right but the idea was that you would climb this immense penis to prove your virility now I haven't got one of those I get strange looks out the window and comments from neighbours when I put my labyrinth out into the garden to walk it Climbing a 10 foot high wooden penis of some kind would probably draw serious comment. So, you know, it's it's picking things at work. Now, for most of these, it seems like they were just offerings of wine, water, food um, for the deities on those days. And that's what I do. Now, combining this with... Um, uh, sort of contemporary lifestyle can be a challenge so for example with the face feast ones like yesterday we were out for a meal and you know I don't necessarily have to say to everybody here that this is a festival day and you know we need to give a little bit of thanks to the goddess I might just silently or into my head set, raise a glass and thanks to the deity it's it's useful just you know having to spend three or four hours of a major festival every few days because you know you've got a big calendar I've got about 40 dates fest 40 individual festivals not all of them at a single date some of them are days some of them are weeks long so um, trying to have a significant amount of time to spend doing stuff with those deities on a regular basis um, in a way, I do feel bad about not committing huge amounts of time, but we have busy lives, and I'm always all over the place. So, as long as I can combine some um, thought or recognition of those festivals to those deities, I think I'm doing okay. Obviously, for those that really mean a lot to me, then I put a lot more time and effort in and I schedule it better. But for these odd ones where it's just oh some festival for Anubis or some for Thoth and oh okay I'll just you know have a special drink or well I've always got special drinks around <laughs> you know I'm on the marmalade mead as usual. But um you know I do something in marking that and being food and drink, it's really quite handy because it's not hard. You know, first thing in the morning I have breakfast, I could just dedicate breakfast to the deity and job done. Um, as long as I'm giving something to them, that's fine. Obviously, we all practice different ways and these things have different meanings. Now, with 40 dates to work with, I'm possibly going to pull that back this is like the first full year that I've actually tried this and um, it's 
been interesting and sometimes overwhelming to actually string it all together. So what else do we do? Um, well, there are an interesting couple of few other interesting things as part, as part of pra comedic practice that I've observed and read and researched and so on. Um, it's handy that I'm the only comedic in the village. Um, there are very few in the, my area and this is like the whole of the southeast of England that I'm aware of that is practicing comedicism. In fact, one that came to my in particular that came to my workshop a week or two ago definitely said she wants to do more so you know I found another one yay and I found a few here on Second Life as well and that, that's great and I'd like to talk to people about their experiences um, and there's a few that I'm looking forward to at the Real Life Witch Fest in less than a week ah, um, really excited it's been all year waiting for that um, that I need to catch up with that are comedic too. So, you know, there are a few of us around, but it's hard to find out. And in a way, that's good because um, comedic practice tends not to be a group activity. Now, I go to a lot of groups and circles and um, groves and a few other things and stuff with local groups, and great, it's lovely to have all the pagans together sharing an experience. But for comedic practice, that is not really how I found things to work. Now we have two ends of comedic practice that I am aware of working. We have state practice that is in the big temples. And yes, they have the big outdoor festivals in front of everybody, cart in the divine statues around and the pharaoh and all that and everything's public there but the actual interaction between priests priestesses and deity is a very private thing the where the cult statue is stored in their nail shrines in the heart of the temple in the dark where no one of the public goes, that is where they practice. Maybe two, two people present, maybe three. It's very few. It certainly wouldn't be a couple of dozen people in there. I don't think you'd actually be able to get a couple of dozen people in or even half a dozen in to some of these core, central, sacred places. So... And then at the other end, in the private, from what I've understood of private um, magicians and so on practicing, again, they were all done. If you look at the Laden Papyrus, there's a few things there where they're doing divination and they're doing it in dark rooms with only one or two people present with the magician. So even there, I would say they were probably practicing their magic in private and not in a group. So... In a way, that helps us get over the problem of trying to find other comedic people to work with. We don't really have to, but it would be nice <laughs> to be able to say, no, I can't really, because we've got to work alone on this. But, you know, <sighs> any others out there? Hello, <laughs> comedic dating sir. <laughs> Link up service. Hello, another comedic. Um, so, in a way, that's good. Now, for my practice, um, if you take it from the pure temple, big temple practice, purification, and this even goes all the way down to the sort of um, village magician, purification was important. Obviously, the two ends of the uh, magical spectrum there had different um, resources in which to practice the purification but at the full temple size where they had dedicated people loads of people in place they could do all this you know I read a report where um, the temple of Karnak even in its decline had over 80,000 people servicing the temple which is incredible to think 
there was that many people involved with just with that big temple. Um, but the, the priests there that were making connection with the deity, they would all hair shaved, constant washing, the most insanely strict diets, and to be absolutely as pure as possible to meet face to face with your deity. Um, obviously in the village, magicians probably wouldn't have that extremeness of being able to keep that level of um, purity up, but even so, some practice of ritual purification would have must have gone on. Um, I know chewing of natron salt was a very important aspect, um, but you know, how do we practice this within our modern lifestyles now and thousands of miles away from physically from Egypt and in time too? Well, I will always try and achieve a level of purity that I can. Um, at the very least, I will brush my teeth. Um, I don't have nature on salt, but bicarbonate soda, nature on form of bicarbonate soda, so I will use toothpaste. Um, bicarbonate stuff is pretty good because that's the closest. So I will brush and wash my mouth. Um, I will definitely shave. Um, facial hair Egyptians didn't really like, and it's nice to get rid of it. Wash, shower if I can. Um, diet. That takes a little bit more planning, but I might not have any heavy meals or try and not eat and drink before ritual anyway. Um, I'll always have offerings that I'll consume afterwards because, you know, that's all part of the process of um, uh, mead, <laughs> um, water or whatever. Um, incense is a good means of purification, so I always have some of that. I have lots of frankincense that I work with. Um, this year I actually made something called capet, um, that Greeks would call it kippery. It's uh, an incredible... Th I made this back here for midsummer. It's well past its, its sort of best now, but it's preserved because and it's not gone mold or anything because of the sheer amount of alcohol and uh, honey that's in it um, but it's um, so dates honey wine frankincense myrrh um, what else have I got mastic um, mint cinnamon and juniper berry. It's um, no one really knows what the proper recipe was because they seem to not actually document it properly. Um, there's certainly lots of late period, Greek period I views of what it is, but they tended to possibly go way over the top and list like 60, 70 ingredients or more. So, you know, I, I pulled this recipe from an experimental archaeologist who uh, went for it and got got it on my fingers it is just awesome frankincense is just amazing so um, I work with that the best I can so incense is good um, so let's think how are we doing quarter two oh, shall we go any further um, let's have a quick look oh magical tools magical tools they are the fun things. We like to have magical things to wave around, don't we? So this year, uh, it's something I've always wanted, but it's the Waz, uh, a Waz scepter. It's, um, obviously I can't turn it because the camera's too big, but it's a uh, staff that's, um, and then there's the fork at the bottom, that's carried as a means of, um, authority by the magician so um, obviously this isn't perfectly straight as what you would get in um, a uh, Egyptian um, drawing because they tend to look very slender this was scepter is made from corkscrew hazel um, I have a particular love for corkscrew hazel I make ones from it um, my website um, house of Kia 
www.ghostbusters.co.uk I have lots and I'm going to be taking one down to Witchfest as a raffle prize um, this week. So unfortunately this Twisted Hazel for this Wasp Scepter wasn't actually from my tree which I generally use everything from my tree. Um, I went to cut some earlier in the year at Beltane because that's when I wanted to make it and I've been growing this particular branch I thought long enough I cut it and it just wasn't long enough for the right height so I mentioned this at one of the moots and um, a friend of mine said oh they've, they're cutting theirs down because they need to get rid of it because it's in the wrong place and they would gift me all the, the remains and um, this piece in particular was exactly the right size and shape for me to use and um, um, you can't quite see I've got a bit of hieroglyphs on the on the staff body and because um, I, I name all my tools or near enough name all my tools and um, I named this as a uh, um, uh, Nerit die I think Nerit die um, which roughly, and that's really probably really badly translates to um, fortuitous gift because this was. Now there are some others. There is my Sistrum. It's um, it's you know you guys on Second Life aren't really going to see this. You definitely will need to look at the YouTube because <laughs> um, you're going to be hearing these things. You're not going to know what the heck I'm talking about. But the Sistrum, um, this one is particularly industrial looking and is not particularly dainty, like most Sistrums that you would see in museums. Um, mainly because, well, I've got a, a slightly industrial. Um, background um, so and I don't do dainty and this was the best I could come up with in fact it's quite dangerous I tend not to take this out definitely don't wield this in public um, and very carefully even in ritual too because it's quite sharp and pointy um, and it scares people but Sistrum is sacred to the goddess Hathor and um, he likes lots of noise. Goddess of music, joy, dancing, food, drink, sex, having a good time. That's why the festivals are always brilliant. If you don't go for any other festivals, go for some Hathor ones. It's a damn good excuse to get completely uh, worn out and happy. <laughs> um, so I, I made that, I don't know, about far five years ago now, that Sistrum. And... Um, I like it. I don't do drums, but I do play the old cis drum, uh, drum in circles now and again when I go to them, which isn't often because I don't do drums, um, and it confuses people. Um, then I have this thing. Again, it's slightly twist. It's twisted hazelnut, um, corkscrew hazel. So uh, it's not quite the um, proper shape that it should be, but it's got the most important bit which is the sort of crook and then um, a sort of flint head and this is in a daze um, the carpenter's hand axe it's used for the opening of the mouth ceremony so when I do any um, work with deity uh, and we're running out of time to talk about this but I could probably talk about this more next time so um, yeah I'll do it I think well it looks like we're gonna go on for another one I think Probably um, some of my actual rituals that I work with, but um, I've always wanted one of these, so I made that out of the um, gifted hazel too. Um, so we will wind up, and um, again, there's loads of stuff on my notes I've not even touched. Gives us a chance to have a go next time, doesn't it? Anyway, so um, any of you here on Second Life, you've all been very quiet, so I've from the odd he he's now and again. Um, if you want, if you if you've got any questions now, throw them out and I'll sort of answer them on this recording. That's relevant to this <laughs> session anyway. Okay, you would like my book list. Okay, um, I've got. Um, 
I'll send you. Oh, okay, I'll send out my book list in a sec. It's certainly out of date. The one here on Second Life. So um, find me, and I will email the proper what the most recent one because I do actually have a current one. I've just not updated it on um, Second Life. Okay, I'll do the sharing of the book list in a moment. Okay, if there's no others, no other questions, then thanks for um, coming along. And I will see you all again in two weeks. This YouTube thing should be up in the next day or two. And um, thanks for coming by. Bye-bye.